Twitter map, Twitter map, Twitter map, Twitter map. Cool. Twitter map. Coincidence? Twitter map beyond belief, fact or fiction. This one was inspired by an actual event. This tweet went pretty viral last year, and my response was DiCaprio pointing finger at TV.png. Marty McFly, I've seen this one before. Dot JPEG. Dingy. He just like me for real, dot weeb. Because I live here. I know this story. If you try to find me, you will be met by my constitutionally protected M1 Abram. I made a minute long TikTok about these maps and got the app's highest honor. An account with a million followers silently nodded along and got 10 times my views. Don't use TikTok. National security threats and the destruction of a generation's mental health are things I can work with. Not paying me for my part in that. Nah. This is going to be a quick video explaining how we got from here to here, why it's not a coincidence, and as a free bonus, I'm going to be vaguely historically accurate throughout. 6,000 years ago, the devil was hiding dinosaur. Listen, I said vaguely, okay? And I graduated high school before this happened, so sometimes you're just going to have to hang with me. 6,000 years ago, the devil was hiding dinosaur bones that trick you from the light of God, and he decided he didn't want to get his nice pants wet, so he just threw the bones all across the beach and went home. The unintended consequence of this is that the land became incredibly fertile. This area is now known as the Black Belt because of the dark, rich soil. Fast forward in an incomprehensible amount of time and people, Alabama has now been settled by Europeans and it only took a mild genocide. Europeans just got access to fertile farmland in the 1700s. The alarm bells in your head should be going off. Where the white man went, slavery followed. And after the invention of the cotton gin, the slave population jumped from just under 40,000 to just over 435,000. Say it with me, class. Industrialization made slavery more profitable. The Civil War was necessary. Sherman did nothing wrong. Oh, way down south in the land of traitors. Just a couple of things you weren't taught when I was in boating school. And checks notes. What? Oh! still aren't. Fun fact, if you take your kids to the riverfront splash pad or enjoy a nice scenic outdoor concert at the riverfront park in Montgomery, the slaves would have had to have walked past you to get to market. I've been there so many times and I had no idea. Maybe the plaques and public spaces method of acknowledging slavery has its drawbacks or intentions. The black belt was where all the farms were and as a result where all the slaves went. At the time, it was the most populous part of the state, the centerpiece to an agrarian economy, and majority black. The reason Alabama had any money in her pocket was because of slavery. February 20th was an interesting moment in time, where in a meeting of the minds, both PragerU and I want to know who is the worst president in U.S. history. Reagan comes to mind because... You know, but the correct answer is Andrew Johnson. During the Civil War, General Sherman issued Special Field Orders Number 15, allotting former slaves 40 acres and a mule from land seized by the Union. Sherman, we stand. An icon. The only Southern heritage I acknowledge is enthusiastic beach trips with the boys. Oh, way down south in the land of traitors. The expectation was this policy could have been nationalized. Would Lincoln have pushed for it? Eh, maybe. But what we can say for certain is that his vice president wouldn't have. I mean, that guy was from Tennessee and was a former slave owner. Johnson had a particular perspective on Reconstruction, where Lincoln was sort of milk toast and soft on the South, making sure they promised to stop being very bad boys if they wanted to re-enter the Union. Johnson said, and I swear you're not going to believe me, but Johnson said the Southern states had no right to secede, so they never did technically. He pardoned anyone who asked him nicely, effectively reinstating the Confederate governments, gave back all the land that the Union seized, and promised that Southern representatives would be allowed back into federal Congress on the condition that they outlawed slavery. To which they said, yeah, sure, definitely. You can trust us. Nothing has happened recently to undermine your faith in us handling this issue specifically. <laughs> then when Johnson turned around, they instituted black codes, which was just slavery, but rebranded. 
Foreshadow and alert, Johnson knew he was just really racist. And you may be thinking at this point, hey, you're only talking about presidents. Where's Congress? Wouldn't they have a lot to say in this situation? The answer is on the swing set, because recess doesn't end for another eight months, and, and it's not like this is one of the most formative moments in American history, so they're not getting off of it. This period was called presidential reconstruction. A splash, a taste even, of the worst possible timeline. A taste, because on God, one of like three times in American history, when Congress came back, they did what you would call the right thing. When Congress was back in session, they told the representatives from the South that they stink and need to go home. And to be sure they washed their ears when they got there, the Confederate states were put under martial law and occupied by the Union military. And, to add a little insult to injury, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed, and it made all of the former slaves citizens of the United States. Um, actually, I'm gonna veto that one, because I'm the weirdest combination of Union-loving and Black-hating. I don't know how Lincoln is considered so progressive when I was his VP. Lamau. Okay, huge insult to injury. The veto was overwritten, and the Civil Rights Act became the 14th Amendment because Johnson was so racist for the time that his campaign against the radical wing of the Republican Party gave them a supermajority. He also got impeached, one vote away from being removed because we can't have nice things. The reason Johnson tops my biggest bitches of American history list is because of what could have been. There was a brief period where the right people were in the right place at the right time with adequate political capital to institute systemic change in the South, to not only ensure black people their basic rights as humans, but to give them an economic footing and political power in the future. Johnson's obstruction turned back the timer and wasted the opportunity. This is why it's relevant to the maps. We're talking about maps. You remember that, right? In 1877, the last year of Reconstruction, eight black people from seven southern states held office in Congress. The Congress. Not those silly little state houses. The big cheese. That number would not be matched again until 1969. Reconstruction ended as a result of the Great Betrayal. And you don't know what I'm talking about because the U.S. education system is a failure at teaching its own history, or has its intended features. In the mid-1870s, there was a mild recession and shenanigans involving the Electoral College, a great combination that only results in the best outcomes. The South promised to elect Rutherford B. Haynes, biggest bitch number four, to the presidency if he ended Reconstruction which he did. Pause. Wait a second. Johnson gave back all the land to the slave owners? Yup. So the former slaves got nothing, and he would likely stand in the way of any reparations at the time. Yeah, I mean, you could be a little less hypothetical about it, but what were the newly freed people supposed to do without any resources? Sharecropping wasn't slavery. It was just a system that tied people to the land using a poverty cycle that guaranteed the landowner a percentage of all crops grown, made the workers buy all their tools from the landowner, let the landowner choose the amount that they paid for the crops they bought, gave the landowner some social authority over the workers and how they lived their lives, and used a lease system that left workers constantly in worry that they would be removed from the property. So a lot of former slaves became serfs, which is an improvement, but it's not the resounding freedom you would expect because sharecropping was a three-paragraph section in your history book. This system didn't end until the 1960s, and over this time, the plantations were decreasing in value. Some of the land just wasn't as viable as it used to be, and the importance of agriculture in the state's economy had begun to wane. And funnily enough, this is around the time period you start seeing black people getting their roots in the land. People were selling their plantations to invest in ironworking and growing industry around Birmingham and Mobile. So effectively what sharecropping did was rob economic opportunity from former slaves and their descendants all the way up to the point that the opportunity wasn't there anymore. Since we're in the 1960s, let's talk about the Civil Rights era. The Black Belt of Alabama was home to some of the most memorable demonstrations in the fight for equality. The Montgomery bus boycott, Bloody Sunday, March on the Capitol, all happened here. But what I want to focus on is schooling. Black schools were subject to underfunding, 
overcrowding, and limitations on what could be taught, which is different than what's happening today. We're talking about this map. I'm not making any wider points about society. I don't make propaganda. After the Supreme Court agreed that these systems were unequal and ordered desegregation, fairies came in in the middle of the night and filled in all of the public swimming pools. And as we all know, white people are deathly scared of fairies, so they left the cities for the suburbs. In the 1960s, Selma, Alabama was effectively 50% black and 50% white. Since then, the population increased by 40% and now it's 84% black and 12% white. But they didn't all just give up immediately. There was an effort to privatize segregation. Yes, public schools had to integrate, but there were no rules against private religious schools for making race a condition on acceptance. The justification given was religious liberty. They stated it was their sincere religious belief that white people and black people shouldn't intermarry. And the only way to ensure that was to prevent mixing in schools. Again, making no wider points about society. No need to draw parallels or ask a question like, if this was the excuse given for all the atrocities in U.S. history, what does it say about people using it today to discriminate against groups like, uh, I don't know, trans people? Don't do that. Don't, don't draw that line. This history is apolitical, which is something that can exist. The cost of being so racist you refuse to send your child to public school? was tax deductible. That is, until Tricky Dick heard about it. He ordered the IRS to revoke tax exempt status of not only schools that refused to integrate, but also the churches that ran them. Nixon we stand, an icon. The only American heritage I acknowledge is spying on politicians being more damaging to your career than firebombing civilians. Bob Jones University led the fight against the IRS policy change. This conflict with the government is what politically engaged the religious right and elected one Ronald Reagan. Biggest bitch number three. If you thought abortion was what got the religious right involved in politics, you're a victim of propaganda. The fear of Uncle Sam revoking tax status for schools that refused to integrate was the start of it. It shifted to abortion later. Abortion was seen as a Catholic issue when Reagan was first elected. There are no individual struggles. A racist movement quickly turned against women. It happens all the time. Intersectionality is key. Don't be gay and a racist or a woman and a transphobe. Once again, you're not going to believe these words when I say them, but Reagan tried to get the Supreme Court case dismissed by reversing Nixon's tax policy. Okay, maybe you can believe that one. The Supreme Court didn't listen and ruled that charity and discrimination are exclusive ideas. So the, the fairies came back or whatever I said earlier and white flight. The case also brought down the ruling that public funds couldn't be spent on private schools, that the public education system had to be maintained. A decision recently weakened by the current U.S. Supreme Court, and Alabama is acting on it immediately. The Alabama state government is using their control over our education system to sweep the worst parts of our history under the rug. As a society, we haven't even begun to consider how successful the Daughters of the Confederacy were at affecting what we consider to be accurate history. The Lost Cause was so powerful that people in 2023 will cry if you try to take down a statue of Robert E. Lee that was put up in the 1960s as a response to the Civil Rights Movement. So we're in the modern times now, and things are going just swell. The black belt is visible on maps looking at poverty, deaths by diabetes, preventable forms of cancer. The second the Supreme Court said southern states don't need congressional approval to change their district maps anymore, we ended up back in the Supreme Court over blatant attempts to shrink black political influence in our state, and the UN's Human Rights Council came here to examine extreme poverty. The main thing they brought up was sewage treatment and how it just didn't exist for large portions of poor black neighborhoods. I've personally experienced digging up a faulty septic tank at my dad's house. Not being connected to the sewer system is a problem. When asked about the problem, state officials couldn't determine how big of a problem it was. Just that it was a problem and they should probably do something about it.
Alabama's chief health officer, Dr. Scott Harris, told us the state has never conducted a survey to assess the scope of the problem. How many households would you say uh, don't have proper sewage facilities? Far too many, although we don't have great data on that. Um, we have uh, made efforts in the past to try to count those numbers, but we, we don't have a way that we're confident that we're collecting all that information. Um, in Lowndes County, um, for example, we think those numbers could be, you know, maybe 20%. You know, or, or it could be significantly higher or it might be lower, but, but we know that it's a substantial number of the population. The Trump administration also pulled the U.S. out of the Human Rights Council in a form of protest of them looking at poverty in America. Just days before Alston delivered his report, the United States had pulled out of the U.N. Human Rights Council, claiming it was stacked against U.S. ally Israel and refused to be reformed. For too long, the Human Rights Council has been a protector of human rights abusers and a cesspool of political bias. American ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, reacted to Alston's report with a strongly worded letter, calling the report misleading, politically motivated, and biased. She said it was patently ridiculous for the UN even to examine poverty in the wealthiest and freest country in the world. This is our answer. Why is the black belt blue? Because the history of Alabama is one of abuse and poverty. From 1819 to now, there has been a systemic effort to keep large portions of the black population as a permanent underclass. And if it hurts white people along the way, that's an acceptable casualty. Slavery tied people to the land. And even though it's been 158 years since freedom was supposed to come, a lot of people are still tied there. These counties were left to rot after agriculture fell in decline. And the people who couldn't afford to leave were largely black. Republicans look at these people and tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps while allowing infrastructure to crumble around them. This is not to say these counties should be abandoned and evacuated. What should happen is a large investment to remedy the wrongs of the past. Build these communities back up. Make them places worth living for all the people who are there. Basically, reparations. Hey look, it's today me and I've only got an hour until I gotta go to work. And look, you can see I'm still working on the video down here. So let's try to get this done quickly. Last night when I was working on this video, uh, my friend that I only talk to once every six months sent me this story and i thought that it was relevant enough to be included this is the first black mayor of montgomery let's listen to what he has to say well, don't ask me. i can come smile i don't have to do no work okay i don't have to do no work systemically and i'm going to be fine and guess what i will always get 38 to 45 percent of the white vote if i get 30 to 45 percent of the white vote i don't have to get the black vote i got this past election i don't win you got black city, that's great. You can have all black everything. And guess what? You won't have green nothing. You know, white, the white money thinks that you are looking after their They will take this to Prattville. They will take this to Pike Road, and you won't have So in an emotional moment, the Montgomery mayor is talking about the irrelevance of black votes in the face of white money. Basically, that he can get elected over and over again and fight the fight for all the black voices that put him there. But if he doesn't make it look like he's working in the interest of the wealthy white people, they'll just leave and they'll take all their money with them, which would be a detriment to the city. This is why all the things I talk about is important because the reason there is no parity in wealth, the reason there's no black wealth in Montgomery is because of the efforts to keep black people as a permanent underclass. Political parity cannot happen until there is economic parity because every politician is evil. The only way to do politics decently is to engage in evil behaviors. So it is important to give the black community wealth so that they can influence these evil politicians via bribes and threats to remove their money. Short of that, you will continue to get this. Black votes are nice, black cities are nice, black businesses are nice, but I need white wealth. He's also a Democrat, so like, you know, look at your politicians, a little, little side eye. 
make sure they actually believe the things that you like because he did run on equity and a more favorable Montgomery for all races. 60% black. That's what Montgomery is. 60%. And white wealth gets more influence to the mayor. 